Okay, thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Toronto's Poet Laureate, Anne Michaels, an internationally acclaimed poet and novelist who has won dozens of awards and prizes for her work, which has been translated and published in over 45 countries. Her most recent works, uh, a new collection of poetry called All We Saw, and a work of nonfiction titled uh, Infinite Gradation, uh, were released in 2017. Your Poet Laureate, Anne Michaels. I'm very honored to be asked to um, help celebrate this wonderful anniversary and I'm going to read a few passages from Michael Ondaatje's beautiful book In the Skin of a Lion which is of course uh, such an homage to this bridge and this is a very very famous scene walking on the bridge were five nuns the bus must have dropped them off near Castle Frank, and the nuns had, with some confusion at that hour, walked the wrong way in the darkness. The nuns were moving towards a 30-yard point on the bridge when the wind began to scatter them. They were thrown against the cement mixers and steam shovels, careering from side to side in danger of going over the edge. Some of the men grabbed and enclosed them, pulling leather straps over their shoulders but two were still loose. One nun was lifted up and flung against the compressors. She stood up shakily and then the wind jerked her sideways, scraping her along the concrete and right off the edge of the bridge. She disappeared into the night by the third abutment, into the long depth of air which held nothing, only sometimes a rivet or a dropped hammer during the day. Then there was no longer any fear on the bridge. The worst, the incredible had happened. A nun had fallen off the Prince Edward viaduct before it was even finished. The man in mid-air under the central arch saw the shape fall towards him. In that second, knowing his rope would not hold them both. He reached to catch the figure, while his other hand grabbed the metal pipe above him to lessen the sudden jerk on the rope. The new weight ripped his arm that held the pipe out of its socket, and he screamed. So whoever might have heard him up there would have thought the scream was from the falling figure. The halter thought, jerking his chest up to his throat. The right arm was all agony now, but his hand's timing had been immaculate and he found himself a moment later holding the figure against him dearly. He saw it was a black guard bird, a girl's white face. They hung in the halter, pivoting over the valley, his broken arm loose on one side of him, holding the woman with the other. Scream, please, lady, he whispered, the pain terrible. He asked her to hold him by the shoulders to take the weight off his one good arm. She could not speak, though her eyes glared at him bright, just staring at him. Scream, please, but she could not. During the night, the long chutes through which wet concrete slid were unused and hung loose, so the open spouts wavered a few feet from the valley floor. The tops of these were about 10 feet from him now. He knew this without seeing them, even though they fell outside the scope of light. If they attempted to slide the chute, their weight would make it vertical and dangerous. They would have to go further to reach the lower deck level of the bridge where there were structures built for possible water mains. We have to swing. She had her hands around his shoulders now, the wind assaulting them. The two strangers were in each other's arms, beginning to swing wilder once more past the lip of the chute. He had his one good arm free. Saving her now would be her responsibility. She was in shock, her face bright when they reached the lower level, like a woman with a fever. She was in no shape to be witnessed, her veil loose, her cropped hair open to the long wind down the valley. Once they reached the catwalk, she saved him from falling back into space. He was exhausted. She held him and walked with him like a lover along the unlit lower parapet towards the west end of the bridge. 
She went down Parliament Street with him. Where she was going, she didn't know. On Eastern Avenue, she knocked at the door he pointed to. All these abrupt requests, scream, swing, knock, get me. Then a man opened the door and let them into the Orida Lake restaurant. She stood in the middle of the restaurant in darkness. The chairs and tables were pushed back to the edge of the room. He brought out a bottle of brandy from under the counter and picked up two small glasses in the fingers of the same hand. She still hadn't said a word. He remembered she had not even screamed when she fell. That had been him.